Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in the study that we started in our last program last week on the Valley of Allah, down in the valley, hallelujah, which you may more readily recognize as the conflict between David and Goliath. When the Philistines had come and were standing on land that belonged to, to Israel, God. and they, the army of God was gathered on one hillside and the Philistines on the other, and for 40 days, Goliath, the giant, had been coming out and taunting the army, and nothing had happened. So we started that last week, and that's still available. But we're going to pick it up where we left off last week. And this is in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse 20 to, to go on. But before we do that, my Alice is going to ask God's blessing on our time in his word today. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We praise you. We thank you. We love you. And we ask you, Lord, to let this word just go into our hearts and help yes. us to do this word when we go forth into the world to share your word. Lord, we just love you and thank you. And we give you all the praise and glory and honor. And we ask that nothing come out of Alan's mouth Amen. that you haven't put there. Amen. Amen. You just said that the land was the the Israelis. You know, the land was, I think the land was God's, but they had stewardship of it. Yeah, we talked about that a lot last yeah. week. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to, in verse 7, verse 20, verse 17, ha. Chapter 17, verse 20. Thank you. <laughs> First Samuel 17, verse 20. That's where we were when we, when we came to the conclusion last week. And it talks about, this is where David had been told by his father to go down to where the battle was taking place. And mm -hmm. of course, there was no battle taking place at this point. So David arose early in the morning and left the flock with a keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse, that's his father, had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting the war cry. So that's what we ended up talking about last week. Mm -hmm. The fact that there, the army is, the army of the Israelites, they're, they're dressed in the battle array, they're shouting the war cry, but there's no battle going on. Just making a lot of noise. Making a lot of noise. You know, and I, I really believe that there's a reality to, to Christianity, a reality to our faith, that we don't always, I, I, more, more accurately, I think I should say, we rarely see, at least here in the Western world, in the church. What are we portraying to the lost? What are we portraying to the world around us? You know, they see us getting dressed up in our Sunday go-to-meet in church clothes. They see us going into the buildings. They see us doing all those things, driving around with bumper stickers, shouting, shouting and yeah. praising. But they, do they see the reality of the battle that we're engaged in? Do they see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Mm. Because if they don't see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives, they're not seeing God in our lives. And I want to make that perfectly clear. Yeah. You know, they don't see God because of the buildings we built. No. They don't see God because of the songs we sing. They don't see God because of the little things. They see God because of his love in us, because of his peace in us, because of his joy in us, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the reality. So anyhow, I'm going to start where we left off in verse 21. 1 Samuel 17, 21. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. Then David left his baggage in the hand of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. The words, by the way, is he's challenging, asking Israel to send a champion out to fight him on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. But I want to make a point of something because I think it's interesting. Goliath, is, he's looking for that champion, and he's shouting, and it says that, it says in the, the version I just read, and, and virtually every version, that David heard him. Well, the fact of the matter is, all it says in the Hebrew is that David heard. Okay. So they've added them. 
virtually every translation adds that, that David heard, you know, heard them, the words that were coming forth. Mm -hmm. The, um, the uh, Young's Literal Translation says this in that verse, Goliath the Philistine is his name of Gath, out of the ranks of the Philistines, and he speaketh according to those words, and David heareth. It doesn't say that David heard him. Well, I think it's a reasonable assumption that David heard what he was, what he was saying. Right. But there's a difference between hearing and hearkening. Mm -hmm. That's the word that I want to use. And the reason I want to use that is because if you read Jeremiah 8, 6, Jeremiah the prophet said, I hearkened and heard. They have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness. You see, there's a difference between hearkening and hearing. And hearing. Mm -hmm. You can hear a lot of things and you don't pay any attention to them. To hearken, hark the herald angels sing. To hearken means to give it real attention to to pay attention, to listen to, to take it into you, all right? If you hear things, if you hear the Word of God and you're not, you're not hearkening, if you're not carefully listening and taking it in, it's going to go blow right by you. And this is why Amos, the prophet Amos, would talk about the coming famine for the hearing of the Word of the Lord mm -hmm. because you can hear it and not hear it. And I'm sure you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between just hearing words go by you and paying attention and taking them in. I wanted to, wanted to say that. Okay. Okay. But by the way, the, the word hearken, as opposed to hear, the word hearken means to give heed or attention to what is said. Mm -hmm. That's the Random House Dictionary. It's about paying attention to what you, what you hear. Okay. So I, I believe that it's reasonable to assume that David heard what he heard, what Goliath was shouting. But I think it's even more realistic to assume that while he was hearing Goliath, it was the voice of the Lord that David chose to hearken to, to mm -hmm. and to obey that day. Because, you know, we all choose in the midst of all the noise around us what we'll listen to mm -hmm. and hear. In Hebrews 5.14, it says that the solid food of the word is for the mature, who because of practice has his senses trained to discern between good and evil. We have to train our senses. We have to train our hearing, our eyes, our nose, our mouth, our, our, our sense of touch. We have to train them to be in tune with what God is doing. We're called to appraise all things spiritually, right? So, yes, that is right. Yes. Yes. It is right. <laughs> yes, it is right. Okay. We have to look at things and see them differently, understand them differently than the world does when they look at them. Okay. Mm -hmm. In verse 24, it says, when all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. That's Goliath. When they saw, now we talked last week about the fact they were first afraid of him when they heard him. Right. Because as faith comes by hearing, so does fear come by hearing. Mm -hmm. But now, since they're already afraid, when they see him come out on the battlefield, they get greatly afraid. All right? It's interesting that in Proverbs, Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be bold. We're not supposed to be moved by what we see, but rather by what we have heard from the Lord. Right. Faith. All right? Uh, it's not, these are not little suggestions or encouragements, when Jesus says over and over and over, fear not, be anxious for nothing. Those are the commands of God. Mm -hmm. Because if you are in fear, or if you are anxious, filled with anxiety, you're not walking in faith. And if, if anything not done in faith is sin. So you need to repent. So you need to repent and choose to walk and act on what you've heard from God, not by what you feel. Be you all know Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, yes. I'm going to read the first three verses, right? Mm -hmm. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things yes. not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Mm -hmm. 
The Hebrew army had been looking in the natural, and what they saw was a giant enemy warrior. We are called to appraise things spiritually. David saw things differently. We're, we're, we're told, and again, this is a commandment. There's no, I don't know, we could try and make a list of all the suggestions in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't wear out much pencil lid, I'll tell you what. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Mm. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and, finish. and per finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Mm. Because our God calls into being that which does not exist. Mm. That's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 4. And it was David, right, who would later write. Now he, this is little David. He's coming. He's come out to this battle, or the scene of the encounter. But later on, he would write from experience. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, 4. Mm -hmm. Is that your confession? I shall fear no evil. Amen. The enemy has been defeated already. Okay? I want to tell you something. Goliath had already been defeated. God saw that. That's why last week I said, you know, you, we can look at this and see what the Israelites are doing. We can look at this and see what the Philistines are doing. But if you look at the Psalms and see what God is doing, it says he's sitting on his throne and he's laughing because he already knows the end of the matter. That's right. So, like I said, you know, we can, you, can, you can sing songs about faith. You can wear nice little pithy sayings on your T-shirts. You can do all these things, but you have to walk in faith. Yes. You've got to actually walk in faith. James, I'm James, Paul, James, Peter, they all say, but I'm going to read James 1.22. Prove, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Mm. If, if you're not doing the word, you are deluding yourself to think that you are going to be able to say like Paul, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Mm. All right, verse 25 says this. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel, and it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? David's concern was not what he was going to get materially. He was not a mercenary. He wasn't was, fighting for stuff. No, he wasn't fighting for stuff. He wasn't fighting for pay. No. He was fighting because he was fighting for God's glory. David wasn't concerned with the riches. What he was concerned with was the glory of the living God, the God of Israel. That has to be us going into battle. All right? It's not about you. He, I, I just read from Psalm 23. Yeah. It also says in Psalm 23, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's about God. It's about the glory of God. So what was the reward that David did get from, from the king when he did this? His daughter. He got his daughter. <laughs> he got Michal, Saul's daughter. How'd that work out for him? I mean, she turned out to be a real, a real prize. That She was a prize, right? I mean, because she hated him yes. because of his willingness to, to praise God mm. without without restraint. All right. So in verse 27, it says, the people answered him in accord with his word, saying, with this, word. this word, saying, thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? Now, isn't that great? When you walk in faith, the people around, the people closest to you, this is David's brother. Accusing. Accusing. You know why? Because your faith 
will upset them because it challenges their lack of faith. Yes. What had he done during that entire time? What had he done during those 40 days? Mm. What had his brothers done? He didn't know it. Well, maybe he shouted. Maybe he stood on the hillside and shouted. But he didn't go out and face the giant. No, he didn't. Your faith, will. when you walk in faith, and I'm talking about you in the midst of other Christians, you will, your faith will either encourage them, it'll challenge them and encourage them, or it will upset them because it exposes their lack of faith mm. and they'll hate you. That's right. Be prepared. Okay. It's a sad, sad testimony, okay, that it was his brother. But I don't know what's going on here. Bear, bear, bear in mind that prior to this that we're reading now, in the 16th chapter, God had sent Samuel the prophet to the house of Jesse, David's father, because he was going to anoint somebody to replace as mm. king Saul. Remember that? Yes, yes. And he had seen all of Jesse's sons, the seven sons. And he chose the last, the least. The youngest. Well, maybe David's brother was upset by that. Yeah, could okay. very well be, sure. All right, so anyhow, in verse 30 it says, Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told him to Saul, the king, right? Mm -hmm. And he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with his Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. Remember what the Lord sent Samuel to. When he sent Samuel to anoint David, mm -hmm. what he said. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Talking about one of the other brothers. Right, right. For God sees not as man sees. Mm -hmm. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord searches the heart, looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. God had seen David's heart. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a wicked heart like his brother accused him of no, having. No, it wasn't a wicked heart. Mm -mm. It was a heart filled with the love of God. Amen. Filled with trust in God, all right? Mm -hmm. So in verse 34, it goes on. It says, David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Hallelujah. You should have have you should have testimonies in your life that you're building your faith on. Yes, okay, yes. so you know that God is with you and God is able. Yes. Now, I I think many of you know. You know, when Alice and I lived in Central America, and matter of fact, Mark was down there in Central America with us. I was hit by a speeding semi truck. I was on foot, and I got hit by a speeding semi truck. And there were two fellows in the truck, and they were killed on the spot. It pretty much broke everything in my body. Mm -hmm. But hallelujah, I'm here. And, you know, and that was a mighty miracle. Uh, I encounter a lot of things since then. My goodness, that's going back a lot of years now. That was back in 1989, the end of 1989 or middle of 89. So now things happen in my life, and I look at them, and I say, well, I've been hit by bigger trucks than that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know what God has done for me. I know the power of God, but that shouldn't be unique to me because it doesn't have to be a giant thing. It can be anything. anything. But if you've been walking with the Lord and you've been walking in faith, I promise you, you should have testimonies yes. of what God has done in your life. And you should know the power of God. You should know the love of God, that he will watch over you, that he does have you in the palm of his hand where no man can snatch you out, that you are precious in his sight. 
That's a knowledge that has to be inside of you. It's an engine that makes everything go around inside Powers of you. you. Yeah. Nothing is impossible with God. Of course, if you, if you avoid all the tests, if you avoid all the battles, you never have a testimony. And you'll never know that. You'll just up, end up being a moany. Yeah, yeah moany. <laughs> so, so realize that these, all of these challenges that come in our life are there to, to cause us to grow. They're fertilizer. But they make our faith grow. All right? Mm -hmm. And the more you face and the more you see God give you victory in life, the more you'll be prepared for the next one and bigger one. All right? Amen. So in verse 38 says, Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with his armor. Did he want David mistaken for him on the battlefield? <clears throat> now, that was a real trick, because Saul was a head above everybody else's. I mean, he was the tallest oh, person right. yeah. in Israel. He was supposed to fight, Go fight Goliath. That's why they picked him. And, Day and David was young and short at the time. I don't know how tall he was, but definitely not as tall as Saul. And here he's trying to wear a tall person's armor. That didn't work. Well, you know what? Don't ever go into a battle without armor. That's right. You have to have armor. But it better be the whole armor of God. That's and right. it better be tested by you. Well, but, but the point is, I mean, you know, I'm not over-spiritualizing this. Mm. I'm getting down to the nitty-gritty. And the truth is, that we are commanded to put on, take up, whole and armor. put on the whole yeah. armor of God. Not Saul. No. I don't want Saul's armor. Right. I want God's armor in my life. Yeah. Okay. Saul was trying to protect him. Well, I, I really wonder if that's what. Or if, as I say, you know, Saul was chosen by the people to be a king, to be their champion and mm -hmm. go out and fight their battles. Right. That's what it says in Scripture. Yes. But he's up there on the hill hiding out from Goliath. Maybe he had some, you know, and I know this is kind of speculation, but maybe he wanted, because the king's armor was distinct. Yeah, distinct from everybody else's. Okay? So if David had gone out with, with that armor on, people so, might have thought that it was that it was Saul. Okay? And if he, that way, if he loses, well, Saul will go off into hiding or something. But, you know, David said, no, he's not going to wear that. He's not going to trust. There, we have to learn to trust in the things of God. Okay. All right. I'm, by the way, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, and I, I don't know if we'll get to it now, about the fact that David had been in charge of Saul's armor for a little while before. Mm, that's right. And something's, something's going wrong with mm -hmm. Saul here, but I'll, I'll get into that, right? Hmm. So anyhow. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine. But David said, your servant was standing as well as you. I fought the, tie, I fought the lions and bears. I can go out there. I, you know, he's not afraid of no. Goliath. Yeah. He is afraid to, to let the Goliath stand there and mock God and nothing be done about it. Mm -hmm. So David, he tried on this. He tried on the armor. He was commanded well, by the king to do king, so. So he would have to do it. Yeah. David yes. girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested him. And so David said to Saul, "I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them." And you know what? But he had tested the whole armor of God. Yes. So David took them off. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Yes. Why did he pick five? You know, a lot of, a lot of speculation about this, a lot of conjecture. You know, Goliath had brothers. Five. Yeah, of course. Maybe he was getting ready for the brothers, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. So the Philistine came on and approached David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. No, I, I have met a lot of people that are into some of these ministries where they want to break curses and they're afraid of curse. You know what? 
Goliath put a curse on David. But I'll tell you what the word of God says. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. We don't have to fear curses. How did this work out? If you think that you can, you know, if you have a fear that somebody's going to curse you, and we spent a lot of time in Africa, and that is a very great fear in Africa where there are still so many witch doctors and pagan religions. Don't be afraid of them. How did that work out for Goliath? He cursed, he cursed David by his gods. You know, years ago, this is going back quite a, quite a number of years ago. It was back in the early 80s. Uh, I had started a little fellowship and a Bible study group in here in Florida. And it grew and became a congregation. And we got out and we got a little building for a church. And when I first did that, I had a, a, a brother, a pastor, who I didn't know, but he came to introduce himself and to meet me. And while we were talking, he said to me, and I don't have any idea where this came up. He said, whatever you do, be careful of those witches, those spiritual spiritists out in Casadega. Now, Casadega is a little village kind of out, it was out, separated pretty much from everything around it between Orlando, Florida and Daytona, Florida. And it was a, it was a, I don't know, it was a village that was founded to be the home to mediums, psychics, or yeah. all, all these spiritualists, mm -hmm. all right? And no Christians, no Christians there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So this pastor told me, be careful of these people. They'll put a curse on you and you could die. And I looked at him and I, I don't remember, I, I, one way or the other, politely, I said, are you nuts? <laughs> I mean, I don't fear the enemy. I fear God. I have an awe of God. When you when, show me a man who fears God, and I'll fear, show you a man who fears That's no right. man. That's right. So he's telling me that I need to be cautious and not step on the toes of these psychics and mediums and whatever they were out there in Casadea. So I did what I think any good Christian should do. I gathered a couple of guys from the congregation. We went out and we attacked that village. The, 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 the women stayed, stayed and prayed. And we went out and we knocked on every single door in that village and mm -hmm. called every single person to repentance. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still here. I know a couple of people that were out there that are not still there because they got saved. Yes. Not everybody did. That village is still there. We are not to be afraid of the enemy. The enemy should be afraid of us. That's, right. That's what I know to be the truth. So, until next week, oh, we've run out of time. time again. <laughs> so, Father, we thank you, thank Lord you. God, that you are our champion. Lord, that we have no reason to fear because we are precious in your sight. Mm -hmm. And you have promised us that you watch over us. Lord, help us to walk in the confidence that should come from that word. Let people see our trust in you, Lord God, that you might be glorified. That others would be encouraged also to trust in you as the, their answer, as their champion. Mm -hmm. That we would all be able to say that we walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. So, Father, we just bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Until next week, God bless you and goodbye. Walk in faith for the glory of his name. Amen. Thank you. Bye.